Welcome back to Pierre Pierre Pressure Pressure Podcast. Podcast. Thank you for listening. On this episode, I talked to Timo Ellis. He's a really fascinating musician. He's a multi-instrumentalist. He plays bass, guitar, keyboards, drums. He sings. He records everything in his studio. He's a solo artist. He's also played with a ton of great bands, including Chibo Mato, Yoko Ono, Sean Lennon, Joan Wasser, also known as Jonas Policewoman, and a bunch of other bands. And he continues to perform with his band, Netherlands, which is a mind-altering, face-melting powerhouse of metal. You have to check it out. It's really quite amazing. And in this conversation, we went deep. We, we got pretty dark, and it was a ton of fun. I really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, Timo was a little worried that he came off, you know, a little sounding a little bit negative or nihilistic, but I don't see it that way at all. Timo has very strong opinions, and he has a very particular view of the world we live in, and he backs all his opinions up with a lot of thought and a lot of humor. We really went deep into the situation that we're in here uh, in America, planet Earth, the universe, uh, and what does it all mean, and what's it going to happen? What's going to happen to us? We didn't solve anything, but we had a really great time talking about it and going back and you know digging deep into the world of music that we love so much and the world of living in America that is a mixed bag. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Timo Ellis. Fuck. fuck, fuck, fuck. And not, not, like, not only that, no one cares. No one fucking cares. What you look like? Except, Except your legions of fans. I know, but even them, like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like, I'm not like a fashion model, you know? <laughs> like, I, uh, not yet anyway. You're a sex, you're a sex symbol. Among, the- like, weird f- aging f- Rush fans. Yes. <laughs> like, you got to take it where you get denim it. Denim vest wearing fucking balding Rush fans. You got to take it where you get it. Are we rolling? We are. We're oh rolling. my God, roll. Sorry. <laughs> we're rolling. Edit. No way. It's all on there. Um, it wasn't, I didn't want to lead with that. Well, um, it doesn't. The Rush much. fans? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I'll lead with something else. Right. Hi, Timo Ellis. Hi. Hi, Pierre. Thanks for talking to me. Thank, of course. Fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks for letting me into your lair of, exactly, of, my, of creativity. Thank you. It's. I, I wouldn't have thought about this way when I was decorating it when I moved in here. Yeah. The, my friend who was helping me decorate it said, this is like kind of the ultimate like teenage boy cave. It is. And like that but sort all, of insulted music my... all s- music studios kind of are supposed to be it, that, exactly. aren't they? You know, it kind of it, it temporarily offended my like middle age guy sensibility. But I was like, that's nah, true though. <laughs> no, I mean, I have one up in my at my house and my wife's always like, dude, seriously. I mean, are you, are you is this your dorm? <laughs> yes. yes. Don't talk shit. Yeah. You wish you had one. You wish she does wish you, she has one. Exactly. <laughs> See, look, you can't see him over there, but I got my Cheech and Chong poster, oh, yeah. my original Van Halen poster from back then. Oh man, that's amazing. Really? Yes. Vintage. Oh, beautiful. Exactly. And then the cramps over there. And you have these beautiful women, scantily clad, uh, kind know, exactly. of scattered for, around yeah. for inspiration. With, I know exactly. And don't show those because in today's climate, it would be like, you know, even even having any nip exposed <laughs> is potentially problematic anyway. It's, it's, like a mean it's well. appreciation of the of beauty. I agree. And they're they're tasteful. It's not they're actually not vulgar. They're I, not at all. I don't beautiful. think so. The nice looking lady. That's subjective. Blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. So you I'm just amazed by like the pure output of all your musical projects and all the, you know, the prolific nature of what you put out. It's amazing. It's Thank great. Thank you. I mean, a huge catalog, but, and you play tons of instruments really well. Thank you. Can you tell me um, how you start, what instruments you started playing with? Was um, there any training Drummer involved? first, mm-hmm. uh, 11 years old. My, uh, one of my, my cousin, Sam Kimball, played the drums and uh, like probably when I was seven or eight, like uh, at his house mm-hmm. and Seeing him play the drums really kind of blew my mind. And then within a couple of years, I started making a overtures towards wanting to play the drums. And and then I uh, got a snare drum. And uh, at the time, my mom was extreme. She, she saw, she basically saw how, like. Into it, how I, yeah, focused like how, you were. How incredibly, are already deeply you know, yeah. in, into it I was and totally supported, encouraged. And then by the time I was, I think I had my guitar epiphany at, at uh uh, that the summer of when I was 11 mm-hmm. and that's uh, entire. Well, I, mean, I was already into rock music or whatever. 
heavy rock music and all music, not just rock music. But then I had my guitar epiphany after listening hearing Unchained by Van Halen on the radio. Nice. And like, it's it's just a joke. It's the anecdote. Is that like, I heard that solo. I heard Unchained on the radio, and then like, like literally the next day, I like lost interest in school. I like lost interest <laughs> in like the whole straight life. I was I literally, I was like, fuck You're all like, this shit. I don't care. It doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, right? When was, now that those guys are around why should i be this guy exactly and it was which yeah. was a total disaster because i was only 11 11 like, where'd you grow up were you here. in new york in this city in, i grew up in manhattan yeah wow okay um and uh so you're like it's you're 11 you already had a snare drum i did and i got and i got a guitar like in that so that was 12 acoustic or electric electric oh really a little weirdo hybrid yeah. uh it was a fun fender. It was like an Ibanez, just blue Ibanez destroyer with a Fender Mustang neck. Oh, nice! Which is just a total weirdo uh, Frankenstein guitar that and I wish I had. It has the pointy, the pointy body. Had the pointy, had the you know, it had like pointy. a kind of a pointy yeah. body. And uh, yeah, I wish I had it. I wish I. Had. Oh yeah, that'd be um, amazing to have. What yeah. what was the make of that? Dude. Nothing. It was a. It was just well, Fender and an Ibanez put together. Oh, actually, actual, Frankenstein an, together. An actual actual hybrid of brands. Wow. Um, but yeah, and like a. So you I started shredding. You were just I like, mean, it was more like drumming. I was really, uh, it took me, I don't know. I mean, I, I, as much as that, like I, it, it took me, and I think drumming, the rudiments of drumming came to me more quickly. The guitar, right. guitar playing, I had to work on a lot more. Yeah. Uh, and, and in a way, I but you learned both kind of at the same time on your own. Self-taught? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I, I, wow. kind, I didn't have that. That, uh, that actually explains a lot uh, overall yeah. about your, well, your whole aesthetic, because I was really trying to figure out like what, where is this coming from? Is this coming from a drum head or, you know, a drum mind or a guitar a, mind? It's kind of both, but yeah. drums first. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And <clears throat> so then it was, a, I, I sort of, the focus shifted when I started playing the guitar. And I, uh, I mean, I, in a way, I stopped regularly practicing drums to play the guitar. But when I, and then I just kept going throughout high school and college. And then it was, halfway through college and I, I sort of I finally had the realization that I was like oh I'm not going to become like a, <laughs> a lawyer or something and like right. actually this is probably it, it was with the 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 realization the awareness of like oh there's an actual independent music scene in a circuit and an underground music scene that's not just like rock star or studio musician that there's a kind of a third way which it's at least possible to plug in a possible career a regular professional professional activity. How did you figure that out? Did you see people that well, did that? I went. Well, I went to Evergreen. Yeah, in, um, in Seattle. In Olympia, Washington, Olympia. and it actually had the and kind of incredible good fortune to be go to end up sort of land there right when uh, that kind of inter- international pop underground and the sort of pre grunge and that uh, certain type of you know radical punk rock performance yeah like the k records yeah people, that whole calvin thing. johnson all that yeah, yeah like yeah. that whole scene yeah um which was very much you know obviously very community conceptualized yeah. and very much like a, a you know it was a whole like a literal philosophy on, on, yeah. on every level you yeah know? is that like an it, art it's school kind of radical lefty kind of oh, thing okay. i mean it's sort no of like grades. it's like kind of like hampshire yeah there's evaluations okay, cool. you know evaluations um which is why I chose it because did I did you was, study music there? No, I did a I did kind of first two years cultural. I did film and video production, and then mm-hmm. just sort of core program cultural studies. Mm-hmm. That did some audio engineering, um, and then you know some f- post colonial studies, some film programs mm-hmm. and stuff. Uh, and uh, but yeah, so ma- mainly it was an artsy. It was on the media arts. I was a media arts kind of person that's what i studied as well yeah, yeah that's yeah, great i understand it's like i want to be a musician but let me do something that sounds like a real college <laughs> exactly. degree. it sounds good and it like looks good when i'm trying to talk about shit yeah exactly <laughs> so did you um join do, do you remember writing your first song at all uh when you I thought mean, like, that was thing, a possibility i think it was in high i had written you know in terms of songwriting narratively driven songwriting songwriter yeah like I was such a, a rock nerd yeah. and like such a, uh, you know, it was, it was primarily like the thing that like was most exciting to me for, for I guess, a, for a few different reasons was this guitar driven, inst- you know, like instrumentally primarily yeah. focused kind of hard rock and metal and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so I have a lot of songs, a lot of instrumental songs, a lot of riffs. Mm-hmm. And of course there were some songs that I, I mean, it was in high school. I mean, really the first songs I wrote were really, totally rudimentary like 
Rip, you know, rips. acoustic guitar kinds of stuff for the first couple of years. And then when I did, you know, covers, I would cover like whatever the police and Judas Priest or the Clash or whatever, mm -hmm. the stuff that I, you know, and then some new wave stuff. And then, you know, all the stuff that I was interested in, that I could actually pull off. Um, and did you join bands like at an early age? Like, did you I mean, try was, doing in, bands? In high school, there was just the kind of cover bands. <laughs> I went to a I went to a boarding school in Arizona, which is a kind of a well. I went to a, I went to a boarding school in Western Massachusetts uh -huh. called the Williston Northampton School, oh, and okay. uh, this is a longer story. I got expelled from there, okay. and I had to repeat. I ended up repeating, getting admitted to this other sort of liberal artsy another boarding school in Sedona, Arizona. Oh, wow. Uh, but I had to repeat my sophomore year. Okay. So technically, I was in high school for a long time. <laughs> Five years. I still have nightmares about some Oh, my of those. God. Wow. Um, and boarding school the whole time, like yeah. living in at school. Yeah, which was kind of the idea at the time. Is like, which a lot was, of people you know, of that generation. And also, the parents divorced. And it was uh -huh. like a kind of like the right idea to get out of the house. Okay. Everyone would, everyone, everyone won. Really? And time. you were cool with it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was like going to college early. Or, yeah, just being able to, if it was possible to not live at home. Okay, then interesting. I was like, great. Yeah. Although I had other issues of exploding my first high school experience by just having too much fun. I was wild and I was fucking acting out like an insane idiot. <laughs> Did have a lot of fun. I didn't do badly, but I just had too much fun, so I got expelled. I ended up going to another boarding school. Uh, what do we be call, called? If, that's how I ended up eventually hearing about and getting connected with Evergreen because mm -hmm. it's a similar sort of ethos of a li liberal arts kind of small uh, type of boarding school. On, in, on in, the West Coast? In, in Arizona. Oh, in, in Arizona, Sedona, right. In Before, Sedona, Arizona. And then you knew from there. It was like the feeder to Evergreen? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, or to, you know, to a large for degree. Evergreen? Yeah, kind of, which is also, you know, what, you know sort of. It's yeah. Like, it, the joke, my joke school. is like, you can sign, I signed my name on the application. You're in. <laughs> Oh, the that was band. the bands in high school in Sedona. Uh, in exactly, that was like you know, like a, what are they called? That was stoner. Stoner is terrible. I don't think I've ever I've publicly admitted this. Uh, one of them was called the Trails. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're such fondhead names, and, and the other one, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't. I've never. I've never publicly. I just, you know, who cares, right? One of them was called the Be Trails. Be careful. This is not for. This is forever on the internet. It's fucking hilarious. One of them was called the Trails. The other one was called the Carbs. The Carbs. <laughs> you know, but not like from carbohydrate. Oh, from <laughs> from, from, from a, the, a bong. Yeah, exactly. From, <laughs> so, of course, I tape influences. everything. So I still have those recordings. You do not suck. But you know, there was and there were some jams. I was those? playing drums and uh, and mostly guitar. Some drums. Um, I had already. I I had. Uh, this is random. I, I'd been, I actually figured out a way to do multi-track recording, like a uh, tape switching, like a, uh, how did you do on, it on, on a Hitachi weird dual cassette deck that I had? Yeah. Like I'd already bought one of those dual, just like a, just regular cassette yeah. deck, but had a mic input and, yeah. and somehow it, you could record something into the right side yeah. with a mic and yeah. then switch tapes and it would actually, I did the same. For, yeah. It's so interesting talking to people like in our generation that had figured where out you had to figure out some multi-tracking situation, yeah. usually with ta tape recorders and microphones and yeah, playing amazing. one thing into the other. Yeah. I was like, and I it's got great. this. Well, it's actually great for your, it's a great way to like then go into, you know, what we have now, which is all the tracks in the world and all the technology no. in the world and everything. Limits you, are good. Yeah, exactly. Like that, that also the 424. I mean, the, the whole task game. It eventually went. Right. It I was in high school that I actually, for, like, uh, yeah. that I started <clears throat> fucking around with those task game four tracks, which are amazing. Of course, you can bounce stuff down, but the quality you lose, like, you lose oh, yeah. quality. So you end you up more wanting more to hits. do like multi. multi multi-track recordings mm -hmm. on four tracks and having to do different things and also do live EQing on right. the fly and all that shit. And, you know, and then and you have to be really it. careful about your, your uh, decisions ahead of time. Oh no, you, cause you can, yeah. you have, you, you, you have to Can't commit. Go back. Yeah. No, you have no, to you commit. Actually destroy awesome things. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, mostly. <clears throat> so you were recording then. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. All through, even before high school, I had done some over, over dubby kinds of stuff. 
like uh, for the carbs. Some covers. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was just we. Uh, well, yeah, we recorded. I mean, we're all just baked as hell. It's just like twenty minute Neil Young jam, <laughs> <laughs> or even like unusually long Smiths jams. Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> what songs were you? How uh, soon Big is Mouth now? Strikes again. Big Mouth Strikes again. Forever. Did you have a bass player who could pull that off? Oh yeah, we did. It actually was good. It's just funny. It's like it's like the combination of the Smiths and the Grateful Dead is. A, I like you that. wouldn't think that was possible, and it's not a great idea. <laughs> okay. No, it makes <laughs> sense. My college band was a combination of the Minutemen and the Grateful Dead. That was basically what we were going for. It's funny. It's another oddball combination. It's yeah. Like dr- hashtag drugs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, everyone who was involved. If you're still listening to this, I, I mean well. We did what we thought was right at the time. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. Thankfully, I only I have the tapes. Oh They're God. not on YouTube. Thank God. They're, I'm going to talk you into sneaking one of them onto this podcast. All right. Well, I'll find us. I, I'd rather play my pre-puberty like Judas Priest jams. Yes, that would be Because cool. those are the fucking, those are. Those are the shit. That would, that would be the most cringe. If I'm going to go cringe, I might as well go full cringe because. It's extremely cute. It's like it's like Judas Priest, but actual chipmunk persons. Is it just you? Like, yes. Is it a, or is it a whole band? No, it's just me. And you're shredding on guitar, and then there's, yeah, you're singing, like singing too? Yeah, it's like guitar, bass, and drums. Oh, really? And, and you're so, doing all four? All yes, three. yeah. Wow. It's so funny. It's like, it's like, that's what the whole thing about, like, I do a cover Paranoid. Exactly. It's like, it's amazing. It's, it's, that one's really it's oh, classic. Oh, we got to hear that. Is there a, a name associated with that? Like a band no, name? No, no. Uh, uh, that was, uh, my little solo band first was called Last Exit, which I stole uh-huh. from Stuart Copeland, which was his, I think it was his pre police. Yeah. There was that and Kirk Curb Air, maybe. Yeah. There's another one of those pre police fusion yeah. bands. Yeah. But then, of course, like, uh, I was like, this That's sounds so cool. cool. That's amazing. So um, you came back to New York in '94, yes, right, and then things, and then you just knocked on all the famous people's well, doors, no, and they no, just said, I mean, "Sure, we want you to be in our band." No, no, I mean, that, that, <laughs> not, not. Uh, my stepbrother went to the same uh, grade school, like K through whatever one through twelve school as Mark Ronson. Oh, okay. Um, I'm God, it's collegiate. I can't remember. Okay. Um, I think that's what it was, but anyway, don't quote school? me on that. Sorry, yeah. you guys. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, Mark Ronson was old friends and neighbors with Sean Lennon. Oh, really? My stepbrother knew that I already obviously was a musician, a multi-instrumentalist guy, of which Mark Ronson and both Sean Lennon are like really yeah. extremely accomplished yes. multi-instrumentalists themselves. Yeah. And so he's like, yo, you got to meet my stepbrother. So this was at their, I think that this was, this was their like, I ended up just going to their gra- their graduation from high school like lunch. They're in the same grade and yeah, in the same class. You know, they okay. were, I think, they're uh, buddies. Yeah, oh, wow. and so they were seventeen. Okay, I was twenty two. Yeah, or eighteen, whatever. They were seventeen. Yeah, and uh, and so they became. You know, then we kind of like, eh, what's up? you know, and then the next day. This was before you came back from everything. Yeah, this yeah. is this is two this is two years before. I can um, do the math because we're the same. Exactly, age. <laughs> it's good, exactly. Easy for me. It's also not that difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, and so then you know we kind of hit it off and then we played we exchanged numbers or whatever you know and then like we kind of corresponded like actually sending tapes cassettes like oh, mailing awesome. each other tapes 
with you know? with Sean Lennon. Or yeah, just Mark, like Mark Sean Lester. and I kind of yeah. hit it off. We're like, yeah. wow, hey, what's up? You know. Yeah. And then uh, what was he doing? Was he was just? I think he was like you know he was also kid. he was just you know I think he went to he went to Columbia briefly, mm-hmm. and then he just decided he didn't want to go to Columbia. Mm-hmm. You know. And was you know was already playing music sort of regularly, or just constantly practicing or playing or jamming or whatever. Right. You know? Um. And then uh, it became, it became, uh, it sort of it, it emerged that like there was a possibility that I I sort of got I got kind of submitted as possibly being a musician in the what would have been sort of like the it pit the informal pit of this off Broadway musical play that Yoko had was pr- producing oh, wow. based on the mu- music for her and John called New York Rock wow. which did get produced. created and produced and that uh And you were in it. Oh no no I, I, just, I basically I got considered for it I got submitted oh, for it. Wow. Um so I got did a Did she have young musicians? No, in I it? mean like it was just I think yeah. there was some context within which I was sort of able Sean was able to kind of like mm. uh, you know sort of shop me in a way. Did you audition or I something? did. I mean I I went to a I did a she they invited me back to to a to she sort of to audition, I, I went to the uh, recording studio. I went actually straight from the airport to the recording studio and ended up recording one of the songs from, which was an early early version of the song War Zone, which ended up on the uh, album Rising, which I also think she just re-recorded or she's probably recorded a few times and also does re-recorded again oh, wow. in the last year or two years. <laughs> It was a song that she had just written for, I believe. Or I'm, she and might have written. You show up, and your your task in the audition is to play this. Just song? to do it, just play to play drums. Do, or inter- what? No, I did everything. I mean, really? I, I did drums, bass, guitar. Show up and demo a song. for Yeah, Yoko. exactly. And I Holy did it, crap. and so that was a. And I mean, how does she show you the song? I'm so no. She just played it for fascinated. me and listened to it. Like, but how does she write a song? Like, is oh, it she's pianoed I mean, out or like what no. Does in it this work? this song, she already had, had a. Oh. I, she she had probably written it on the piano. Uh-huh. She had probably you know you know because that's probably it's the, usually the instrument upon which she mm-hmm. you know that she right. writes music. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, but she already had there was there was another there was an already existing version of I it see. like with that was so you could learn it. Yeah, it no, it was of, also it was reasonably not not too too complicated right. rock song. Wow. And I did it, and uh, and I don't, I didn't get the the gig because I. But you show up and you do like a session with Yoko yeah. in the studio. Yeah, it was That's amazing. Kind of cool, it was unbelievable. It's I was, amazing. I was having a full blown panic attack. Yeah, I was already a huge fan of hers. Yeah, I mean, like a really giant fan of hers. Yeah, I know. And people so that was also give her a lot of shit. I think she has no, some unbelievably amazing stuff. No, people stuff. don't know. I mean, it's a much longer know. story. Like, yeah, you know, but people, yeah, it's like. No, there's so much amazing yeah, stuff. No, incredible. She's she's a. Uh, Maverick and a, mm-hmm. a visionary yeah. and a total fucking badass and, a, yeah. and an unbelievably uh, intuitively incredible instrumentalist, right. vocalist, and writer. Right. She, she's a quadruple threat. She's yeah. everything. <laughs>
people don't know because of sexism and racism. Right. And the Beatles, blah, blah, and blah. And super blah. easy kind of reductionist history. Yeah, that bullshit. Just gets, yeah. It's, it's annoying. And it's, it's like my, 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 my lot is to fucking, you it's know, endlessly mission. to stand up for her when yeah. people just voiced fucking ridiculous bullshit about it. Because you actually Uninformed know bullshit yeah, about exactly. it. Yeah, like, exactly. So wow, so that happened, and then you and you, you got to know Sean through. Yeah, that. I mean, I had been I had been corresponding with Sean and playing, and when I would come back, I would come back for you know whatever. Sometimes over the Christmas holiday or whatever, a few times I came back, and we hit it off. And then there was sort of the occasion for us, like oh, you know, we're gonna you're gonna make a record. We're gonna actually make a solo album with Yoko. When it was in that context that I was like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna move back to New York. Okay. Um, after living out in the Northwest for six years. Yeah. Um, and then writing recording jamming developed a whole body of you know like a sort of r rapport with sean and this other uh, amazing musician named sam Koppelman, who's also another multi-instrumentalist okay. who's a friend of sean's mm -hmm. and uh that turned into the sessions and the recording of making this this album called rising which we made and we did a couple of tours and uh with two you know that that was incredible it was just whatever it was that was an unbelievably uh, you did a couple of tours. You made an album. And you did two tours. Yeah, with this Yoko. is in 1995 and 1996. Wow. And where did you go? Uh, there was one of them was like around the big cities, the, met met the metropolitan centers in the U.S. And then uh, the other one, the second tour, which was uh, later, like a little less than a year later, was around Europe and the centers, and also in Japan. Wow, what um, an experience! Yeah, it was incredible. 95, you said? Yeah. Oh my god. Um, and so that was a uh, yeah it was it was amazing. And uh, you were um, was, all kind of trading off on instruments. Oh in uh, yeah, the, for the record, for the on the record we all played. I played drums and bass and some guitar and um, we all we all kind of did. We all Sean plays keyboards. He, Sean plays everything. Sam, yeah. Sam is a primarily was the drummer, but he also played bass and he plays tabla. I mean he's an excellent tabla player and a great guitar player wow. too. So there's and this is before Sean Lennon had done really like solo stuff no this is probably this is so during this, the same time oh no this is pr prior to that prior to that yeah. yeah I hadn't done anything like that yet yes Sean hadn't put out a record or anything like that no right and so and so then that actually this is this leads into the Chiba Mato mm -hmm. era which is that the uh, the record company was putting together a remix album of songs remix songs from Rising they got Thurston Moore and they got the BC Boys and they got Ween Oh, um, okay. To do like the remixes from the Rising thing, and they got Chiba Mato too, and we just met them in the Wait, concert. Chiba Mato was already a band. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, they had already been going. At yeah, that like point. they. Had, I mean, I think oh, they had okay. probably gotten signed within the last the, the year, Were two they on year Grand period. Royal? Were they on? No, it was, it was Warner's. Warner. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so they uh, the, the record company is like, hey, you should meet Chiba Mato. Were you they know? just like a two piece? Yes. Doing recording. Okay, so they didn't have like a live band. Really not not. Uh, they had done. They had done. Uh, I think more samples and yeah, it's, and singing. I think more. You know, they had they had on the records. They had a bunch of the killers play with them. Yeah. The first record's full of amazing, whatever. Yeah. The all the downtown killers. Okay. Of which they're actually part. They come from that scene. Right. on the record Mike Mills is on the record I think I like the, the jazz passengers some of those uh -huh. guys and like just they I'd have yeah. to look again it's been a long time but yeah. like they just you know Rebo I think oh yeah I was gonna say yeah sounds like, like and, something he'd be on. you know that's just that yeah. that whole that whole that that, world. that scene yeah you know? um and so we ended up uh without really knowing we ended up hitting it off with them and like just whatever we ended up jamming and like uh, and then eventually over the next maybe eight months or something that morphed into 
us being like their kind of Sean and I being the sort of their band, you know. Wow. And then although Russell Simmons from the Blues Explosion yeah. was in the first, he was in the first iteration of the live band, and Sean was playing right. bass. But then he had John Spencer Blues Explosion commitments, and right. he had to do that whole thing, and that was when I got called in. So there was this little project in between called Butter 08. That yes. was like John, Sp- I mean, uh, Russell Simmons yeah. was in that, and all those dudes were in that. And Mike Mills, Rick. and then Rick Lee yeah. from Skeleton Key. Yeah. And, uh, were you in that? I was just, I play, uh, we, I got, I play on drums on one song. So yeah, Butter Butter was in Butter was in that window. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Chiba Motto, Sean and I were the uh, it became the the band the, the rhythm section, um, and then out from that actually, and then after that, Sean ended up uh, after after that whole first wave of touring and promotion for the Chivo record, it kind of morphed into Sean actually developing all the body of all of the work for his solo album. Into the Sun, which was on Grand Royal, mm-hmm. and that developed into a show. We got uh, there's a few other people, there's a percussionist, another guitar player. I you played bass in that band. Oh, cool. um, did a bunch of touring with that, which is fucking amazing because we were on Grand Royal and we got to fucking open for the BC Boys in yeah. Japan, which is nuts. Wow, in yeah. Japan? Yes. Oh my god. We also toured with Beck on the Odelay tour, which is unbelievable. Oh, that was, oh, no, that, I'm sorry, that was Chiba Mott. I forgot, confused. Sorry. Chiba Mott tour with Beck. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, that, was, uh, that was one of the, that was the, the, the Viva La Woman tour, but that was also incredibly amazing. I vividly remember how fucking rad that was. Um, <laughs> with the, oh, uh, yeah. The, As a dr- and you're doing like drums I, and. I was in, in, in Sean's band, I was playing bass. In Chiba Mott, I was playing drums. Yeah. Um, and then, so that it would then. And then, so the Sean, that was the, that wave of Sean Lennon, like a promotion for the record, all the touring and playing for to support Into the Sun. And then there was, then we switched back to the Chiba Mato world into preparation to make the second record, which was called Stereotype A. Yeah. So that was like uh, 98, 99, was 2000. Nice? Um, and so then, then it became, yeah, so there, there was, it was sort of like Yoko, Chiba Mato, Sean, Chiba Mato again. Okay. And then like a, and then during that time, I did the entire cycle of touring for Stereotype A with mm-hmm. various people. But then for no- normal life existential reasons, that whole wave, the, the wave of energy mm-hmm. and of band mm-hmm. ended up, you know, naturally kind of diverging around in 2000 and early 2001. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, yeah that to... was that whole wave of a the wave of, of bands. That's incredible. So yeah, 96 to 2001, 95 with Yoko, but then through 2001. So, yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about this song, uh, Negative Likes, as like the conceit of this podcast is that I try to get people to talk about politics. But when I started looking into all your stuff, it didn't seem like it was going to be very hard because you no. you talk about stuff and you're not afraid to express yourself. And <laughs> there's a lot to talk about these days. That's true. And so there's the one song that comes to mind is the song Negative Likes by Netherlands. Right? Yes. And. Um, from the Hope Porn EP. It's which came out recently. It's or? from February of seventeen. Oh, seventeen. Oh, no, 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 eighteen. Fucking whatever last, whatever this last year was. I think it was eighteen. Yeah. The one that just <laughs> left. Yeah. So it's an amazing song. Um, Thank you. It covers a lot of ground. I feel <laughs> like there's a lot of comments about how fucking annoying social media is and how we're all being led by the nose to uh, be consumers and. Um, being numbed by comfort and yeah. you know sort of the the whole struggle of like trying to be active or trying to be awake but also just we're doing pretty okay because we're like white guys in america yeah. you know so yeah. it's like talk about it how do <laughs> that well <laughs> throw uh, a lot of stuff at you um what does this song well, mean to you the the entire phenomenon of how we consume information and how we're basically locked into getting all our news and feeling connected with other people quote unquote uh using these digital platforms after so many years um it becomes like a you know it becomes like a not, it's not even a phantom it becomes like a, a, a the psychological limb and the platform upon which we end up feeling like we're up to date with reality and we're up to date with other people and also relevant as people and as artists and on any level 
there's an element of like a it's just become like it's become sort of an indispensable limb and platform for our the way we even conceptualize reality in our relationships with other people and also uh you know everything with culture you know right. how was our experience of fucking human beings and human society pop culture art music politics fundamentally like structurally now informed and dependent on this entire sort of mode modality and these platforms for communicating with each other and in terms of like how news gets filtered or censored or processed or digested or diverted or any of these things and and how we even conceptualize ourselves as what our civic and responsibility is and and also the effect that it has on in-person activism yeah and like and actual real life in terms of uh you know in, engagement with other human beings like in the life like out out in out in the world and not not sitting in front of a fucking computer or staring at your phone well you know? so that's interesting that you you know you t you mentioned uh in-person activism because i think part of the vibe i get from that song and a lot of them and i may you might not like this is a lot of critiquing a lot of criticism and not a lot of solutions sometimes no. and i'm wondering and i understand because i have the same you know we all have that uh that instinct to just be like this is so fucked you're all so fucked everything's fucked yeah but we kind of got to like if you think okay what's the next step what should i do about it are we just missing like the weather underground coming and bombing shit like what's the solution no. well that's the thing like uh well uh, i mean making loud ass metal is a no, I mean, pretty cool solution, something. I think. And, 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 <laughs> yeah. At least, like, I mean, I'm not like a. It's what maybe just for starters, like, take do a do a sort of a really uh, brutally ruthlessly rigorous analysis of your own relationship with all this yeah. stuff, and also put it in the context of what the fuck's going on politically and culturally in right. such a way of actually like what the the ratio is of your critique or your vitriol or mm -hmm. your dis you know your dear your uh, outrage about mm -hmm. things relative to like, uh, well, you know, thinking and talking and yeah, critiquing or anything yeah. versus self action. critique as well. Yeah. But also the thing the idea, it's like, uh, there actually isn't a fucking solution. No. The idea that like, you actually like, well, so now be positive about it. Well, for starters, like stop fucking using it so much. Oh, for the internet. Yeah. yeah. Actually like be a person, right. be a person, you yeah. know, like actually be alive uh, uh you know and reckon with the fact that you've become a fucking addict and i'm not talking about the social media i just mean to the internet oh yeah you know i mean really it's like it's, it, you don't have to be in my opinion you don't have to be in the gutter or have like sold your house or be like pimping yourself right. for it to have real have profoundly destructive and just very negative impact well, F, by the way everyone is pimping themselves no i'm right well, <laughs> i mean in, in the, not, not in the not in the commercial way right well, in a way, yeah. your your you know your comment, your question speaks to the idea that like everything's got to be balanced out with the, the solution oriented. This is first first for starters. We have to like actually just identify the problem, and also just very very brutally, honestly, you know, just without even talking about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, we got we got to be clear that we have, we have a big ass problem. No, like we're no. all massively addicted to this thing, this yeah. new thing and, that's come. And steamrolled our entire right. world. Yeah. It's like I know the the idea of like of course there there's there's huge value to it. There's obviously you know there there's some there's some very valuable functionality to it, which is amazing and revolutionary, incredible in terms of being able to connect with people and to um you know to actually network on the basis of uh, about events and activism sure. and also just the, the the for example the the ease of Facebook Messenger, for example, it's like replaced email. It's it's the actual. It's uh, for many people. It's like the you know it's become yeah. the, the primary channel via right. which you actually end up communicating with people, which is so easy. It's incredibly whatever. It's incredibly convenient that way. At the same time, like you could also argue that like uh, you know has some other like uh, unintended you know. Well, you have to look at Facebook to do it. Yeah, first of all, you have to like yeah. also be on a computer. Well, you have to be yeah, on a computer. And you also have to be you're you're, you're consumed with this thing as opposed right. to like a. Which is which is very well. You have to be on a computer yeah. to talk on the phone nowadays, right? But that, more the, or less. What? Remember nineteen ninety five? Right. I mean, it's not to say I'm not idealizing that. At the same time, like people were maybe. Uh, I hear there's like some new vintage, like go back to flip phone, like trend happening, like ta tapes too, and everything. Walking away from smartphones or something, like, yeah. which I, which would make sense. I'm getting a landline. Leave me a message. Yeah. I, you can talk to me if I'm home. Right. Remember that? I do. You also have to show up. You have to show, show up, up when somewhere. You, yeah, when you say you're going to. I know. I'm just saying there's, I mean, whatever. It sounds, sounds curmudgeonly. And so like, curmudgeonly. But, but like, it's, you know, I'm, I'm well, at the very least, it's problematic. And like, I'm not like, 
I'm not some, you know, it's like a, an unquestioning champion of the whole thing. As much as I appreciate all the obvious benefits of the technology, it's a, so, oh, you're saying like, so all the critiques. So what? Well, no. So I'm, there's, that's two, there's two different things going on in that song. There's the internet, social media, very clear. Like yeah. I hear what you're saying loud and clear, but you're also going really hard at, um, capitalism in my, uh, that's my interpretation yeah. and like just, you know, the consumer culture that we live in. Yeah. That's and true. you're going hard. At, we have, that. have we conceptualized ourselves in terms of, uh, brands. Yeah. Right. Primarily about optics. Okay, yes. Yes, I am an artist. But I'm still gonna fucking bear witness, okay? If I could change even a millimeter, a millimeter of anyone's thinking. Well, then that makes me an activist, Nihilus. Everything is either a complaint or a command. Wait, wait, what? Or both. Or some kind of simultaneous acceptance and rejection of things. Even me to hope that like a rant like this can actually penetrate the ideological f format of the pop song, which generally naturally co-ops things into safer, more manageable like hope narratives and or romance narratives. In this case, an anger narrative or an art narrative or whatever. Okay. However, I just want to be clear that I am on the record as not reinforcing the military, family values, or evangelical Christian narrative, which I roundly declare. Fuck off! appraisal of U.S. imperial foreign policy should force Americans to at least flirt with sincerely validating the philosophical and ideological foundations of terrorism against U.S. interests. There's another one that I really love that I wanted to talk about too, which is Surf Surf's Up, up that All one. Night Wrong. <laughs> love that. The, that the, 
I'm sorry. Go. I, I, sorry, that has a lot of. Good, so it's sim- rich. Similarly, yeah, it's deep. scathing. Well, you say something really interesting. You say I'm a nihilist who bears witness. So maybe I'm an activist nihilist. I, I think that's, that's a pretty interesting concept. I, I, I just, that was, or that, you can say I am, but you no, no, threw that out there. That entire it's an it's a total freestyle. I love it. Yeah, that whole that's entirely improvised. That whole rap is it? Whatever. Yes. Wow. So I mean, I don't I don't have like a I don't have like a some kind of thesis to back that. Yeah, but that it's I, coming from you, dude. Yeah, it's true. No, no, I'm not I'm not disclaiming it. I'm saying yeah. like I'm just like well, it just sounded like it made sense at the time, which is I'm just oh, oh, you know saying like. If you're if you're a true nihilist, you just wouldn't be like broadcasting anything because you'd just be like fuck everything. But I'm not. I don't. I definitely don't feel that way at all. You don't. So it's like kind of like being like an optimist nihilist. Uh-huh. They're they're of course they're opposed. You yeah. could argue that those are, uh, uh, I, I diametrically Diamet- opposed. But you know the truth is is that they're not. There's so there's actually like a. It's more of like a realist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, I'm not really a. You know, the dipping, you know, actually defaulting or dipping into full blown nihilism is what we're all fighting against, because I think that's the nature of the system that we're in. Right. Is uh, actually just a extremely cynical, self-serving, uh, just, you know, like out of control uh, uh, worship of the self. Absolutely. And of, and of the pursuit of just one's own fucking comfort and isolation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So at the same time, where I'm, I'm certainly not I'm not a not an avatar of those things, but I'm sort of urgently trying to decondition myself or at least just not just tacitly fucking be a be a, a like an uncritical avatar of all that shit yeah without at least saying something which is great <laughs> saying something is great the thing is the thing that i've been realizing lately or i've been feeling lately is that um the right and the left just kind of like meet in the middle in the same place which is that everything's so fucked and i can't do anything about it and that's the thing that really makes me uncomfortable because i still think that I have to do something like I, whether it's vote or get my ass out on the street and protest and do whatever. I have to do something because it's so, if you're saying it's all fucked and nothing's going to, no. nothing good's going to happen. You're exactly like no, you're, you're, everyone well, you're, else, yeah, that, that's whether not, they're right or left. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That's not a, and viable. that's a very comfortable uh, position that a lot of people are taking these days. Young people, yeah, you know, on the right or the left, or, you know, well, even if they're saying Trump's a total idiot, but, I, but it's okay. Cause he's doing, it's keeping me from have to, having to decide anything. All that stuff's <laughs> predicated upon like the endless access to these same media platforms and food and water. Right. I'm just saying like those are the, I mean, for me, like the, the more macro, uh, the ongoing kind of realizations or just sort of insights or perspectives that I'm having really all culminate in the now already underway environmental mega catastrophe. <laughs> like I'm just saying, like that's the thing. Right. It's like the, uh, the full blown revolution. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is something. I think this is a very, very broadly Chris Hedges paraphrased idea. Is that the, uh, you know, as long as the the liberal classes and the sort of the creative classes, as long as those people still have jobs, mm-hmm. like the the revolution won't happen. Right. It's like as long you know. So it's, it's when there's when the so called creative classes actually like lose their ability to work. That's when it's then that those guys end up getting together and start drafting up revolutionary rhetoric right. or whatever and actually until then but the heads. thing is the amazing thing is that the, even people are starving to death they're still able to subsist and actually think that everything's going to be all right, right and that everything's fine and that way there's endless resources and that technology is going to save everything based on crumbs based mm-hmm. on fumes yeah. of just like i mean that's the amazing thing it's like youtube and facebook are enough to keep people in this you know to like them, themselves willingly keep themselves in this fucking flimsy this, ass fucking hallucinations for hamster for, wheel yeah. no, for for like indefinitely. indefinitely meanwhile like the fucking like the world's fucking on fire and the the the, the, yeah. the biosphere is dying around them they're like how what do i look i <laughs> saw a really cool video yeah you know i'm not i'm certainly not uh i'm obviously i'm fucking wrestling with that because i'm still even like even trying to make art it seems like really decadent. I mean, of course, it's important to actually just speak. You know, obviously, that's all I do. Well, it's so what you do, and it's what you're, it's yeah, what you're good at. Yeah, of course, I'm going to actually yeah. continue doing it because it's. Like, and you at least talk about shit like yeah, this thank in you. your art, you know. You know, and I'm certainly I'm not like I'm definitely not. I mean, the whole thing about me is I'm trying to. That's what like in negative likes. I mean, for what it's worth, I'm not congratulating myself for this, but I'm trying to be as I'm trying to get as. You give yourself some shit. Maybe, maybe I don't know if you're no, the bohemian definitely. parasite or the exactly, complicated artist. That's exactly artist. what I was going to say. <laughs> it's like, really, what's the fucking your justification for this? Right. Know? I mean, I don't know the, uh, for me personally, like uh, I, uh, as someone who has a, 
uh, who has a kind of obsessive and uh, an inclination towards uh, addiction, addictive, right. addictive behaviors. Yeah. I am finally after this, after 11 years on Facebook or whatever, I'm actually at the point where I'm like, I've making myself fucking, I've made myself mentally ill, iller with my habits this way. Yeah. The answer is not to like go on fucking vacation and just jerk off and, and like read novels or whatever. But at the very least, it's like, you know, get your, get your fucking mind independent, get your actual well, mind back. This is very interesting because you're, you're sober, right? You, yes. And so you've been, you've gone through that process. So you know what addiction is. Yes. And um, you've made t- steps to get away from it. So are there concepts of, you know, like Facebook and Twitter or whatever addiction that could be that AA people could like just help the rest of us well, yeah, figure out how to get this, this fuck off this thing. In this case, like, I mean, you're, you're like a, it's about the principle is the same. It's about like a avoiding. It's about craving. What right. you're doing is you're actually indulging in a form of like a yeah. entertainment, right. which is actually like totally legal and fucking fully sanctioned and endorsed and I everybody. And it's like ubiquitous and it's totally above ground celebrated in in such a way that people don't realize oh yeah like i'm actually i don't know how to be alone Mm -hmm. lonely bored Mm -hmm. even process like complicated ideas or even re like uh, even take the time to like grieve for example that's one of my biggest that's one of my biggest the things that's the most disturbing to me is that grief is get like it gets it's lost you know it's like like, someone dies and then then the next second it's like it's like and brunch it's like, you or, know, or I wrote a little thing on their Facebook page no, it, and it's cool. Yeah. Let's go. Have brunch. No, no. It's also like the thing is, it's what I call the, you know, it's like this, it's just grotesque. It's like what I call the box office ization of everything, uh-huh. of course, which is the same thing with movies and like how much money it made and how many likes you get. Right. And like that, those are the metrics by which you determine whether or not you're like a fucking vi- Valid loved human being. or even like you're yeah. up to date or you're actually failing or succeeding based on box office stuff right. which it's like you know it's like i better craft my grandfather died post so that i get maximum engagement right otherwise cr- his whole it, life will have been for nothing no exactly i don't <laughs> i mean there's been there's been i i just i don't know i mean I, i'm alternately like i i go off and i feel like rave and i rant about things pretty in a strident way about various things mm-hmm. but i've made a conspicuous point to not talk about things in my personal life just because I don't want, I feel like I'm tarnishing it. Mm. I don't want to actually, I don't want to conceptualize the stuff that's going on in my personal life and have to start conceptualizing in terms of like, like making sure that it goes over with everybody and that everybody knows about it. I know there's something it's like this fucking, it's It's nobody's business. It's scary. It is. And so I don't know. Again, like I know I sound, I am like a, I know I come across being strident and You're possibly You're just a pre-internet ar- guy. Like, yeah, exactly. Like some of us are just pre-internet creatures, you know, know like homo sapiens. I'm like sucked in so hard. I mean, yeah. I, I'm like a, whatever, it's a, I'm embarrassed. I'm frankly, I'm a little ashamed and I'm fucking embarrassed that I've actually allowed, this, but, allowed it to bamboozle me so much because you know I did, though? yeah. One of the things I've noticed from your uh, work all your stuff is that you're really good at the internet. You're really good at making shit. You're really good at making videos and creating little things that are really engaging. Like I love those shame, the shame party. Thank you. Can you talk about the shame party? Uh, I just wanted to do a little talk show, short form talk show that it ended up being more comedic than I, but I mean, short form when I watch it, I'm like, is this just a trailer or is, is there longer? Or is it, yeah, it was they're for, literally like 30 seconds. They're all a minute, a minute. It was meant for, it's the Instagram world. It was meant. It's so they wanted to, you know, like, I, I, and thank you. It's I, so good because first of all, I think I'm watching a trailer and I'm like, Oh, I wonder where I can find the whole episode. No, it's the whole You're thing. like, that's it, dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. I really, I, I mean, for me, that was a, it was a, I don't know. It's for me, it was like, I was definitely neurotic about it. And I, uh, going public with my, my sort of my, my, my geeky and sort of whimsical sense of humor. Like it, it felt like a risk for me. It's so is totally this something no. just to explain to people who might not know shame parties like this little series you did. You just did it at one point. You're not doing it. Anymore. Oh, no, no. I got You're like doing... I got like there's 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 14 or 15 that are actually been released. I shot 28 more. Oh, really? A couple of wow. months ago. Amazing. I just took time off in preparation for this big oh, tour. That's so an ongoing thing. So yeah, it's yeah. one minute little snippets. Then they're like interviews in front of like a green screen. Yeah, exactly. Like somewhere we are, in yeah. your mind. Yeah, in a exactly. Very with place. conceptual with, voices and also just like with people you know. And yeah, it's all the amazing characters. world of weirdos. Yeah, amazingly 
uh, high uh, high end freaks that I know from the art and music yes. scene. Um, great. It's it's fascinating. It's been really interesting. Like, what I, sorry, I'm, I just no. Go ahead. Go ahead. But what I, what really blows my mind is like you get like you know Mia Hattori, Mia Hattori or and or whoever in here, and you're just like I'm gonna do one minute. Like yeah. that's a lot of work for one minute. No, no, like, it's great. It's no. The, the whole thing about that is that the the interview itself. Yeah. Oh, of course, I edited him down a little bit because yeah. they asked maybe one or two questions or maybe yeah. three. Yeah. The interviews themselves are like five minutes. Okay, okay you're done. So it's you're like it's like an assembly time. line. That's great. Which is cool. That's why I was I did twenty eight in a weekend. Oh, so you get people over and maybe they cross paths. And yeah, it's exactly. Like and just the whole thing. It's like oh, the in cool. and out because. It is a shitload of work with yeah. it, of course, with anything like with the editing and the yeah. fucking green screen and the yeah. sound stuff and the music and I. Uh, it was a cool. Can it was, people it was, hear the effects on your voice? No, they, they can't. No, that's what I figured. I'm like, they're being amazingly cool about these they fucking chipmunk able, sounds they, they, that are coming. Getting out of interviewed by like a, a, a an like alien, a, like a squid or something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it wouldn't good. be the same. It wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to take it as seriously. It's so there. good. It's so good. It's a great idea. I love it. Thank you. Look out for tons more content, even though I'm like moving to fucking the outback of Australia. I'm like, I'm going offline completely, but look right. out for tons of more content <laughs> exactly. every fucking day forever. It's like, I'm like, I hate the internet. Exactly. But I love you and don't ever leave me alone because otherwise I'll die without your approval on your legs. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, that's what I mean by being mentally ill, yeah. especially in a branding. I, I, I don't know my whole thing. What is it about? Oh God. It's the, uh, uh, the thing. It's like people are able to identify themselves as being like these part part of a you know actually progressive up to date progressive like humane liberal human rights type of like a location in the culture based entirely through branding and optics yes you know in these short form just through optics which of course yeah. is nothing i'm not there's nothing it's nothing new obviously at the same time meanwhile they're actually still functionally fundamentally party to like a sinister, earth-killing, imperialist, right. genocidal juggernaut. Like, like a like sinister, sinister earth-killing, earth killing, imperialist, imperialist, genocidal, genocidal juggernaut. juggernaut. Exactly. And it's in that fucking... That's the thing, that the part that I'm interested in. It's right. like, how are you... Like, if you, you just brand yourself on this team. Yeah, I mean, also, like, yeah. I mean, like, that's that part. And it's certainly not, like... It freaks me out. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because... I don't want, I don't want to live that way. And I don't, you know, and well, first of all, let me go back. The word branding, have you ever thought about the word branding? It bugs me so much yeah. that we use that word like gleefully when branding is something you fucking do to livestock or to slaves. Yeah. And we all just say, cool, do that to me now. I is, want that, to. is that the origin of it? Yeah. That branding, is the origin. It's a I mean, brand. I, I knew that. You know, psh, burning your skin with That's the a, fucking guy who owns uh. you. That's what branding is. And like, we all want to be branded. It's gross. It's insane. I know. It's and really it's also nuts. like if you don't. You're a fucking loser. Yeah, exactly. So that right there is very weird. It's it, like, I, I need to know what the essence of your quote brand is within 10 seconds. Yeah. Otherwise, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. Which is scary. Like, actually, what? No, I'm a person. I'm a human, yeah. I'm also, my uh, my art is like complicated. possibly a little more elaborate than that exactly. or whatever. Exactly, right. But it better not be. Otherwise, you know, we can't sell it to fucking the, it's clear channel. But what's really kind of scary about that is like, I just read a uh, biography, autobiography of Michael Moore. And I love Michael Moore. I don't care what people think. Yeah. I think he's fucking a hero and he's yeah. amazing. And he's really smart and he's clever. And one of the things he really digs into is these kind of like wealthy liberals who just are just exactly the same as any other capitalist piece of shit. Yeah. But they just are on that team. And the way they make it work is they just give money to the right causes. And I just, I don't think that's enough. No. You know, it's no. just not enough. Definitely not. Yeah. You know, I mean, like that begs all sorts of questions about like yeah. what the next step is. I mean, that whole thing right. is, what are the kinds of things that it's going to take for people to like give up these toys and these tools and actually have the sense of like life threatening urgency? They're right. like, if we don't get out there and start fucking blocking the freeways and shut down right. fucking Whatever. Whatever. Do like, some boycotting. Yeah, no. I've anything. been saying this for years. Look at the French. I mean, the French are crazy. They're the world class complainers of the world. I know because I'm I'm one of them. But um, they just shut shit down and things change the next day. Yeah. They just. I mean, it took them three weeks. I I the whole gilet jaune thing. I don't know if you know about it. It confuses me. I don't really understand it very well. I That's don't. the recent thing in France. Yeah. But 
what the French did, which they do all the time, is they're pissed. They get on the street. They shut the fucking country down. Yeah. And, it, and the government does what they want. We could do that here. We never fucking do that. Like, when's the last time so Americans you, have gone right, so you and me, on strike? Here we go. Here we go. What are we right, doing? So what we do is you and I go stand out on fucking the Pulaski out there yeah. and just get run a over. Sign. <laughs> get run over by a truck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We started, though, and they we, were... It didn't the, the, work. The legacy well. lives on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm yeah, exactly right. Well, well when I was in college, my uh, entire university went on and blocked. I went to UCSD in San Diego. We blocked the five freeway with bongo drums and shit because we were pissed about a fee hike at the university, which seems insane. But we shut down the freeway for four hours. Hundreds of thousands of people like like it fucked up their whole day. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying like that kind of stuff is kind of cool. Like I like when people do shit like that. That yeah. really disrupts fucking industry. Yeah. And no, and knowing shuts which, things down. That's course. where the power Dude, is. That, that's that's yeah. all we've got left. That's all we've got. I mean like voting we have but sustained non civil disobedience. Exactly. Now here that sounds great. Here we are like in our in a bubble. We're and in like, Brooklyn. Let's do it. Like <laughs> I'll get to it later. <laughs> like I've got so much. No, I mean to like do. what's that's what I'm saying. Like and I'm not even I'm not condemning anybody else. It is up to you. But I mean, look, like, what do I, that's what I'm saying. Have you ever thought about think about everybody you know. Well, that would say the same thing. All right, what's it going to take? What do no, you- but listen, when I go on like, I, w- I go to like the Women's March or something and I see people like, oh, those people are being a little unruly. And I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. They're climbing on a thing. I say, that's cool. They're young. They're Let them do it. I'm not like, ooh, oh, that's not right. You shouldn't like walk, you know, stand on anybody's private property. Fuck that. This is a protest. No, I know. I, I applaud that. Maybe I'm not going to do it. But I have different reasons because I have kids, which is a whole other. The kids are going to jail too. The kids We're are gonna going to get them to do it. I get the kids with me, and they write signs, and we've done. I got my kids, you know, out there doing it. But let them write their own signs. They write signs, they believe me. Oh yeah, they're amazing. Do they we write went, signs that go against your signs. You know, they wrote their signs were like their signs. We went to the women's march, and they wrote, "Women, yay! Trump, boo." That was their sign. Yay, women. Boo, that Trump. It's a little binary, but I get it's it. Binary. I agree, though. They were fine. Let's be, let's be, of course, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to critique them. It's not course. super complex, but. No, I mean, I'm just, my only, I'm just kind of gently being like, kids with signs, they're like, yeah, mom and dad fucking told me how to do it. And like, of course. Oh, it's, I know. It's brainwashed. No, I mean, it's and fine. I've it's better. They're like, that. again, if you, if you saw the kids on the other side, you'd be like, how dare they? I <laughs> took my kids to an anti-gun uh, thing in my town. I live in like a redneck town in upstate. And there was like a gun control act thing. And I brought my kids and people were like outraged that I would bring my kids to a political activist thing. They were just like, oh, it's so terrible. You're just. No, I don't feel like that. It's you just, know, no. Even it's I love just it. with the thing with kids, it, again, it's like, it's the same thing. It's not even the same thing, of course, because in general, the political sentiment and also I, you know, for, for philosophically everything. I agree. I agree with your kids. At the same time, when you see kids at the KKK rally, you're like, they don't know. They don't know. But then, That's, yeah. you know, really funny you say that because, okay, I was reading Michael Moore's book yesterday. Maybe they do know. I don't Michael know. Moore was in a movie, his very first film, he got kind of roped into being on this documentary about a, KK, about a KKK rally. And he's in it for a second. It's before he made Roger and Me. And it's all these people at a KKK rally. And there's little kids there. There's like two year olds. And I was like, looking at them, watching them really carefully. I'm like, they don't know what the fuck's going on. They're just like seeing where the hot dog is that they could get. And where you know, so part of it is like, yeah, they're being brainwashed, but probably even you're they're just, just along for your the kids. ride. They're just exactly. along for the ride. I, know that it's, I don't have like, I don't have a, like a deep objection to it. Yeah. It's just funny when you see kids with signs because they're like, it's cute. Oh, it's cute. They're like a mascot. <laughs> the only reason I brought up that also is just, just to sort of fuck with you because I've seen, seen oh, you yeah. rant about the kid subject a lot no, and I completely am cool with it. No, I get it, man, because I was there like before I had him. I'm not uh fundamentalist about it no, I mean, <laughs> in any I think, way i don't know i mean there's it's 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 complicated because the world is in a very dark place no, i mean like my <laughs> thing I, of course this is this is a little it's a it's a it's it's sort of it's a little polemical it's, it's supposed to be provocative but like you know my shorthand humor i have is like okay you're having kids they can never own a car they can never eat meat. They can't buy any plastic. Right. You can never do that. That's the deal. They can never. Because you're own... just adding to the problem. No, I'm just saying, like, you're bringing the idea two more that they're going to have all the resources that you and I had. Oh, you're saying, oh, they're in trouble. Yeah, no, I thought you meant, no, no, the, thank the, you for wa- creating more waste no, no, monsters. No, I'm just saying, if you, as the parent, that's yeah. your responsibility. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. You can't, like, uh, 
you know, like that's the like. Okay, You're saying great. when they're Congratulations older. Congratulations on your new kid. Just so you know, they're never allowed to buy a car or use a car. Why? Because like they're the they're the the the, the fucking earth and the actual resources that exist on that scale can't possibly handle it oh, i'm saying the idea assumption is like oh i have a kid they're going to be able to do everything that i do right that's ridiculous right of course There's people are like understandably for- like kind of willfully you know sort of like selectively <laughs> ignorant about <laughs> well, it well you were normally understandably i'm not even i can't that's what i'm saying i, I know i understand but the, the the other thing but then that wouldn't wouldn't that just be an argument for suicide <laughs> it's already happening Civilization's going down yeah like it's not like it's not like technology won't save us yeah i'm sorry i'm just saying it's not there's a there's incredible this open-eyed just reality to suggest that at the rate we're going unless there's some kind of like shamanic fucking psychedelic revolution with people right. where everybody like stops fucking eating meat and driving and everybody has like some kind of like worldwide epiphany that like you know whatever that the capitalism imperialism run amok the way that it is and unless we have some catastrophic wake-up calls which is possible which is already happening might uh might, at the best might jar people into like mass civic cooperation right in which case where everybody stops traveling and stops eating meat mm-hmm. and stops traveling right like and all especially the elites and the rich people who are actually you know really responsible for like you know right. the, the gratuitous and absolute grotesque but uh, see that's a solution i like that where you're going with that i'm yeah. a little bit of more of an optimist i guess where i think like that's what we have to do. And also, this is my thing because I brought two kids into the yeah. world. So now I have to kind of try to come up with solutions. So yeah. less traveling, no meat eating. Yeah. Cool. Fine. Start so, now. So <laughs> Let's I know. Do it. <laughs> but the point, but then my, but then my next thing is how do you make that happen? Well, we've talked about like sitting on the freeway and like trying to fucking, you know, uh, pummel people into uh, leaders into thinking about it. Does voting even work? Is that like uh, a thing? Well, of do course, you vote? Obviously, yes. Okay. You have to, yeah, of course, within the existing channels. Mm-hmm. The channels that exist, right. obviously, not only not only nationally, which is much more problematic, especially with the electoral college, right. but on a local level, absolutely, okay. in terms of making sure that abortion doesn't become right. illegal and that, like, you know, that like healthcare is in, in whatever that and, they don't teach, of like, course, every, as much you know, as possible, it, it actually in civic in, or whatever. Yeah. involvement and engagement has to happen on that level. At the same time, don't like hang too much fucking hope or optimism on that. Peer pressure podcast brought to you by Russia. Blizitsa era svetlych kadov. You know, there's a, uh, it's to Chalmers Johnson, who is an author and a scholar. And, uh, you know, he just basically did a broad paraphrase of him. It's just about knowing how empires fail. Right. Like, uh, you can't, he, basic idea is that you can't have a tyranny abroad and democracy at home. Right. It doesn't work. Right. So it's in that context that you're like, okay, well, we're like, I feel better about this now. But meanwhile, this is my thing. I mean, this is, again. We're this, still supporting massive. Yeah, and also, like, I mean, this is the thing in a, in a way, like, you like, uh, you know, whatever we have, obviously are going to pay our taxes because you don't get to get fucking thrown in jail right. and actually be a tax objector. Those are the people that actually put their morals where their mouth is. Yeah. Of course, I'm not going to do that. It scares the shit out of me. Right. I'm fucking, I am scared of that. i thought about that a lot. Blah, 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 you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Like, but, uh, you know, like, it's the idea of, like, is your right to health care. I mean, this is a, kind of a false equivalency. I'm, I'm, I'm prefacing it by saying right. that. But the larger picture context is, like, is someone's right to health care more important than the life of a civilian who we bombed. Right. Like that's the thing for me. It's like, you know, some of, some of the, some of these people that are regarded as being like, there you know, are the heart hopes is from the democratic side are themselves long time, uncritical hawks. And like right. in, in, some in of actual, them are, but chan- not all of them. No, I mean, but I'm there's, saying, it's getting better. Man. I really think there's no, some. I mean, I'm just saying candidates. the people, the people that are actually like they're true socialist and possibly right. the, you know, those people actually the, the ones that are saying like, you know, no, we're not going to fucking like Hewlett Packard and Raytheon and the military industrial arms complex. Those people have to go. Right. Those people would be like, mm, you know what? We're not going to like let you guys be get power. too much traction. Like, yeah. I mean, even though whatever, for whatever you want to say about it, even though it's certainly not as black and white simple as this or idealistic, but it's closer to someone like Bernie who was actually yeah, like, exactly. you know what I mean? Who was actually. Or like, Oc- Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, I right. Like I mean, oh, even she fur- further to the left and, you know, which is great. Yeah. If you're not talking about imperialism and colonialism and empire and occupation right. and institutional 
racism yeah. and colonialism right. upon which you know which is predicated upon is... institutional racism then you're not putting things in the proper larger picture context not only politically or philosophically, but also historically. Right. So you can't compartmentalize. You ought not compartmentalize those things. It's like, well, we have to deal with all this stuff first. No, it's all connected. And in fact, our country and our economy is entirely being bankrupted by those, you know, by those institutions. Right. And obviously, there's trillions of dollars being spent on all that shit. While there's not enough money for anything here, and so that conversation, right. it, it, as long as that conversation, as long as that stays disconnected, then I don't think that people are really going to be able to have like sort of the the be able to put things in the proper context enough to possibly at best galvanize them to be like, Oh, the stakes are, I think some people are, are having that conversation yeah. uh, and that's well, what I like. You know, yeah. I want to find those people and well, I'm sort of here we are. For them. and here we, <laughs> but I mean also people who wish, who, who are crazy enough to want to like have a life in politics or whatever, you know, and be part of the decision-making process. <laughs> we're both fleeing the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like the writings on the wall. <laughs> yeah. I don't, no, I don't want to be cynical. Talk. It's horrible. I, I always think to... like, oh man, this is kind of just like a fun question, but yeah. if you saw who's like your most annoying politician that you see in the paper, you're like, oh God, this fucking person just makes me cringe. Who, the worst? Yeah, the worst. Uh, Mitch McConnell. Yeah, me too. So say you saw Mitch McConnell at a restaurant in like Manhattan. Would you say something to him? And what would you say? Mm, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he deserves like a, he deserves some uh, pie. Yeah. Or something. Not yeah. piss because that's too mean. Yeah. But he pie. definitely deserves, he deserves shit. Face. He deserves shit. Yeah. He doesn't deserve to be beat up or killed or anything like right. that. He, de- he definitely deserves to be embarrassed. Right. At the very least, if not right. fully confronted. But well, because there's this thing yeah. of like Washington where it's like they're Paul just doing Ryan their job too, this... and it's just a sporting event. And it's like, no, it's not Dude, fucking Pence. Sport. Paul Pence. Ryan. Oh. oh my God. These people that I mean, whatever, it's just, it's just generic. These are generic, like out no, it's not generic outrage because it's legit. It's totally the thing that's the most infuriating to me is the level of cynicism and just craven uh cynicism yeah. that all these people are like, let Trump just run around and be a total doofus yeah meanwhile they're actually like you know they're drilling in the fucking it. national yeah. parks and everything like yeah. that they, it's all it's all it's all long game yeah and like and plus they're all evangelical fucking racist sexist fucking sociopaths yeah exactly. and uh, you know i'd like to say that to them in the at the restaurant yeah no i want to i mean I, I honestly like he deserves it he i, I you know yeah, he deserves to get punched in the fucking face. Oh, but at the I know. same time, he just you, you, you know you lose credibility when you do that. That's true. You degree. do. Depends. Depends who you are. Again, that's debatable. Some people be like, you know what? Based on the amount of harm, yeah, and uh, damage that that's, he's actually that's done. That's getting off least, easy. That's yeah, getting no, off nothing. really easy. He deserves, if you're Paul you know, Ryan. Yeah. But you know, um, he can be thrown. He can just be you know thrown in the water or something. <laughs> like, um. So like we got into. I I feel like your uh, musical thing. Like we got into. Uh, Chibamato, and then you've done all this solo stuff since then, all yes. this really amazing stuff. Thank you. And then, um, and Netherlands has been for a while. How long yes. have you been doing that? Uh, I mean, I started in the mid aughts. It's really, I would say, properly when I really got my mind together to actually organize it into a really proper thing it was around 2010. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a little while. And are you, um, you just put out an EP with that, and there's several there's another LP the most recent thing we did was an LP it's called Black Gaia yeah which is you know about that yes <laughs> the earth that stuff dying. we were talking about yes um, yeah cheerful that's, stuff uh, no but it's it's really cool and um, I'm curious like how how do you feel about just the world of putting out music now as a musician like in the uh, world we live in like what do you do I mean you put out all this great stuff you put a, I think a lot of it's out on Bandcamp and kind of yeah, free or streaming no I mean all of no, it it's all there's for sale. The Spotify yeah. which is Highway Robbery and it's right. also the only game in town da, right. da, da. it's the metric I was gonna by, ask you by which you actually have to that game you have to play in order exactly. to you know sort of register on the radar of possibly other you know groups of sponsors or benefactors or whatever right. like uh, booking agencies or labels Anything like that, you know, have to indicate your growing fan base. Otherwise, it's on Bandcamp, which is the way to go because, you know, the artist gets the biggest chunk. Do you make any vinyl? Do you do I have. Yeah. Uh, only with Netherlands. There has been, uh, there's been two, there's been two, Silicon Vapor, which is the double album that we did in 2014. And then most recently we made Black Guy a vinyl. Cool. With limited edition. They're very yeah. nice. Yeah. 
That's so, awesome. You know. um, and you have a record, you kind of have your own record label. Or record, I do. It's called Records, records and, and Tapes Records. Records and it's tapes really records like, it's not, love. it's, thank you. So it's, it's one of those things from like, you know, like Pothead from 2000. <laughs> like, I'm going to have a label called, in, in name, I've had it for a long time. And then I actually sort of finally incorporated it. It's really just my little boutique mm -hmm. home platform. Yeah. Um, and it's not, there's not some, there, it doesn't have like some kind of a uh, greater platform. Do you there. actually put out tapes? Uh, I have, I'm going to, yeah. Really? I have like, a, I've done some super limited edition stuff. And nice. I mean, I can, you can't see it. I actually have a, I have tape decks. Oh yes, I see These, a tape they're deck They're not right there. ironic tape decks. I have, I have fucking, too. I have, I actually have all my, cause I'm that old. I still have all my tapes. Oh yeah, me too. You know I what I mean? Tapes. So if you have make a tape, I can play it. It's not like, what is this? Where's yeah. the download code? I know, I know. <laughs> I have three fucking full, there's two full solo albums and a solo EP already in the can. I have three albums already just in the can on the shelf that I wow. regard as being as good as anything. It's like my best work, whatever. Yeah. I'm about to making another Netherlands LP, which will be done at the end of March. Are you going to do any shows? Uh, with the for next one is I think March 13th at St. Vitus. Oh, nice. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, we're generally playing a, it well, be, I'm going to put this out before then, and yeah. I'm going to go to that show. Amazing. Be Come awesome. on down. Yeah, man. That's going to be cool. But I also just want to ask you about some other, just like looking through your whole thing. You did some stuff with Jonas Police Woman. She's amazing. Yeah, she's I really great. like her. I got to perform she's, with her a couple times back in the day with like Joe McGinty. With yeah. the, did you ever do the Loser's Lounge stuff? No, I didn't know about it, of course. I've been yeah, there. yeah. She's great. tours i play on a couple of the records mm -hmm. just do some good it was on the in the band i played or one, one of the i played bass on on one of the tours and then i did a kind of a duet tour with her mm. where i played drums and oh i saw a video of you guys in a stairway doing a oh yeah that was sonic right. youth cover yes that was right. amazing thank you the sacred that. trickster that Were you guys one. just on tour the two of you on that we did that was oh, our wow. duet tour it was called the interpretation domination tour i think it was 2011 wow uh, where we did a bunch of covers and, but you know, it was sort of like a. We actually had the Tascam four track as our, as our band. Oh really? You know, we kind of re recorded like really kind of simple, uh, uh, minimal version rhythm section versions with the four track. So I was able to play bass and guitar and drums and sing and ukulele and whatever. Wow! You know? With over a four track. With a four track, we had wow. tapes. We had tapes for each song. I had to like. That was part of the Flip show. The was actually like, and now the next song. And it was like, click. Oh, that's you know, great. Make sure to rewind stuff before the <laughs> next show. That's great. And um, it, do, do you know Petra Hayden? Have you ever I done do. stuff with her? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know from back in the day. I haven't seen her. I haven't. I haven't played with her with Chiba Mato. Oh, she was. Back, she played with uh, Chiba Oh, Mato? She, she did. She's she's done various projects with Yuka Honda. Okay. I think she is called one or one or one of their bands is called If by Yes. I know, I like that band. Yeah. Um, I love Petra. If you're there, I love you. She's amazing. She's she is great. Maybe genius. someday I'll get to talk to her on this podcast. Yeah, great. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> hint hint. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I'm gonna look out for it in your inbox, Petra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spoiler. And then yeah, Kristen McCord. Do you know do you Oh yeah, I made Kristen? a couple of she's records. She's a cello her. player, right? Yes. Yeah, she's a friend of mine. We used to play together. Yeah. I was it was nice to see her in her name? Yeah, so we have we are we have our duet, our band. It's called oh, Biker Period. Really? Yeah. Biker we, Period. That's yeah, the Biker two Period, of you? yeah. Oh no way. We have two records. The first one is a guitar and kind of cello improvisation with a bunch of overdubs by me. And the second one is uh like mostly like a it's sort of like a sad synthy make out album. That sounds it's like, like a doomy synthy. It's like a sad Eno make out album. Yeah. Which is cool. They're really good. I like them. Love it. Hi Kristen. Hi. <laughs> if you're listening. She's out there. Um, cool. Th there's a there's a fair amount of licensing that's gotten happened with that's happened with those stuff because really? people love that stuff because it's like kind of that moody, yeah, cello and then synth stuff, which is like oh this is nice or it whatever. Feels pleasant. You know, my stuff is often a lot more confrontational. <laughs> love it. In many cases. Well, man, I think we covered it. I think this is good. I love you. 
I know. Uh, I just you know, thank you. I think hope so. Are you saying I love you to me, or are you saying I, everybody? <laughs> so I, I'm saying I, I'm trying to disclaim everything. If you don't like me, She's I'm sorry. Up. I'm just doing my best. I'm also high on fucking caffeine, so bear with me. <laughs> it works. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pierce. Well. Thank you so that was much. Fun. Can you edit the shit out of this? So I'm gonna I edit like it so you fucking... sound like some other guy, like an intelligent, okay, exactly. All the shit. All the person. shit where. Where, where, totally where, whatever person. I said sounded like terrible or was talking shit or that I sounded like entitled or something like that. I mean, I'm going to have to like do some serious edit where it's like... It, 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 it. Like, no, I'm just going to take your actual sentences and just like, categorize all the words and then put it back together into other sentences that I'm going to write. Totally fine. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. That sounds good to me. That's the kind of thing I would do. I know. Have you seen my talk show, right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, okay, good, bring it. Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, that's amazing. Pierre, thank you so much. Thank you. I so love much. you. Peace, goodwill. Also, look out for all my you shit if you care at all. You know? Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Peace. Later. Thank you, everyone, for listening to my conversation with Timo Ellis. That was fun. I enjoyed that very much. That is the first time. The expression sinister, sinister earth-killing, earth imperialist, imperialist, genocidal, genocidal juggernaut, juggernaut was ever mentioned on my podcast. I believe maybe it will become a catchphrase. Maybe it'll be a thing that people make t-shirts of. It'll be a bumper sticker. I think it's a really kind of apt description of certain parts of our world and our system and where things are going. But I want to be optimistic that things will turn around. Hopefully, the world will not end in a sludge filled fireball of dinosaur like extinction for human beings but maybe it will sooner or later that probably will happen but I hope you all have a great day before that happens and a great year and a very impeachy year so everyone happy new year talk to you later au revoir